Hey guys, so welcome back to another episode of the Warrior Painters Podcast. I'm Angela, and today we have teacher extraordinaire and artist extraordinaire, Virginia. Uh, could you please introduce yourself a little bit to the audience? Well, hi, Angela, and <laughs> hi, everybody. I'm delighted to be here with you today, even though I can't see you, and I guess you can't see me. <laughs> this is, you know, the miracle of a podcast, but I'm, I'm excited to do this. And so a little bit about me is that I've been a working artist for most of my life and been a teacher. I taught for about the last 13 years and I still just would rather draw than anything else. <laughs> That's cool. In a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> um, could you like uh, maybe expand a little bit on your toy design career and your teaching journey? Okay. Um, I fell in to toy design. I had uh, you know, I was looking for a job and a friend of mine said, well, they're looking for art directors at Mattel Toys. And I thought, I don't know if I could do that. And he says, well, I guess you won't know till you try. <laughs> and I did. And I interviewed there. That was back in the early 80s, I guess. And the first person I interviewed with was Boys Toys Packaging. And they really did call it that back then. And he said, hmm. I've never hired a woman before, but well, okay. He really said that? He really oh, he's, said that. He's lucky he's not in 2020. <laughs> he's long retired. So, okay. you know, part. <laughs> but I mean, even then I was like, whoa, you just said that. <laughs> but anyway, so that was not the job, but that's okay. I did, I got a job there and in, in, within a year I found myself doing product design and I felt like I finally had fallen into the best job of my life it mm -hmm. was I always loved toys but what I came to learn is that there are toys and there's the world of play and creating toys and then there's the toy business and those are kind of you know sometimes they don't feel like they're the same thing mm -hmm. you, know, you kind of had a tribe of people who who are the designers and the artists, the sculptors. And then you have kind of the, the marketing people and they're not always, you know, they sometimes are, have come from different worlds, but that was yeah, all part really of different. <laughs> that, that was all part of it. And, you know, somehow in between the two stuff got made and, you know, I mean, at a working at a company like Mattel, somebody told me when I started, if you see 25% of what you design get made, you're lucky. And I thought, whoa, that's not very good <laughs> odds. But he was right. That's but really that, true. It yeah. was so nice that he said that because, you know, that made me feel better. We're working in a really small company. You would see a lot more of your hands on stuff getting out there. But for a big company like Mattel, that was... You know, and especially back then, there was so much that was generated in the way of ideas and exploration that would kind of funnel out to something that wasn't always recognizable. Yeah, but because sure. there's marketing people deciding what will actually sell. Yeah, um, it's interesting that you even mentioned how like 25% of what you do is going to be made because I feel like even in like um, the entertainment industry. I'm working on like TV and feature right now. Mm -hmm. And I realize that that's really true. You can't get attached to what you do. Right. And um, I think we'll, we'll touch on that later on, but I think it's important for people to understand that going into a career. So thank you for bringing that up. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> that is such a lesson. This is what's hard for an artist. You care about what you do. You can't not care about what you do and you can't not put yourself into it. But part of being in a business, you know, and in many ways, toy design is even more and more very much an entertainment design business. They're very connected now. When you wear your heart on your sleeve, it's a little tough. And it's because it won't necessarily come out as your vision. When it sometimes it does, occasionally that happens. That's pretty exciting. But it's just part of learning to not take it personally if someone doesn't, if it doesn't work, because it's bigger. It's bigger than what the one person imagines. Yeah. Um, then is that like inspired you to become a teacher then? Because you're like, I'm sick of this. I need something where I'm more artistic. <laughs> That's an interesting question. Actually, it took, I mean, I had been freelance for a long time 
at the point that I uh, started teaching. And the nice thing about freelance is I was doing all kinds of things, but it was about 2007, 2008, and the economy was getting kind of wonky. And me and a lot of uh, people who did freelance were seeing their businesses just not doing so well. And as it turns out, a good friend of mine had become the chair of the toy design program at Otis. And, you know, we're kind of unique in that way. I mean, there's two toy design programs in the country, and we're, I still think of it as a we. We were the only three-year program, and then there's on the East Coast, there's a two-year program. And I was excited to give that a try. You know, I mean, I asked her, I said, hey, do you, do you think you could use somebody to come in and teach and she was just so welcoming and it was like that was great because a lot of it has to do with her Deborah Ryan I mean she was a great team builder and so most of us had been at Mattel the school of Mattel and it's just a really fun team so that was 13 years I got to do that that's really awesome um so what got you into art then did you have like any family influences Oh, gosh. Well, I guess I'm one of those people that you meet that has thought of themselves as an artist since they could hold a crayon. Really, I never wanted to be anything else, although I think I had a big picture of that could be a lot of different things. But Mm -hmm. I was encouraged. I was really fortunate that I had a mother that encouraged me. But I would have to say my parents were not people, they were well-educated people, but they could not imagine somebody making a living as an artist. (laughs) And that was just not in their realm, as it was not in a lot of people's realms. And they just said, well, I think you should be a teacher. Well, I just hated that idea. (laughs) There's something about the family script, you know, you know what I mean? When your family, it's like, well, here's your choices of what you should be, because these are things you could actually make a living at. Okay. Mm -hmm. Artist is probably not one of them. And so, but teacher, I mean, just because my cousins are teachers, I, and I think I fought that idea for so many years. And the crazy thing is, is once I really got into teaching, I thought, I love this. My mother was right. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it runs in your blood. <laughs> That's really cool. So, wow. Um, they were supportive, but then they wanted you to be a teacher. But like you ended up becoming a toy designer. That's really, really that awesome. That's very left field. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, and that's, but I do consider that being a working artist, you know, and you know, I mean, I know a lot of people in warrior painters are, we make a living doing art, but it's not the same as, you know, when you get out and do, you know, what your heart just wants to do. Yeah. But you, you know, you make it work because it's still a pretty good life to be able to do that, you know? Yeah. It's kind of drawing, but kind of not. I know exactly what, yeah. So I'm going to actually ask you a question about that later. But um, before that question, I wanted to ask you, like, how was it to work as a toy and product designer? Then, Like, I guess, um, did you see any changes from like your career? Oh, yeah. Oh, interesting. That's been a question I've really been giving some thought to, you know, considering when I started back in the 80s to now, I would say the biggest change I've seen is that when I started, especially in mass market toys like Mattel, it was about as not just gender defined, it was, I hate to say gender stereotyped, there you go into Toys R Us and there's the pink aisle, which there kind of still is, but it was girls toys. It was very much that. And then there were boys toys. And then there was preschool, which got to be kind of just preschool. And there was this little odd category that would pop up now and then called make and play. And they used to say, well, the kids that like to do make and play are not the Barbie girls or vice versa. So there was such a sense of things were so in these very distinct categories. And I'm happy to say that I've seen that less and less over the years. And even just since I started teaching, I feel like I am seeing so much, you know, those boundaries are so going away. You know, I mean, I'm so glad because I think it's something that they've come to see the toy companies are even seeing. We have to keep up with the world, you know, so let's get past these stereotypes. Like, thank God, finally, (laughs) dolls that don't look 
like Barbie necessarily and you know just <laughs> things that are not in such stereotypical roles and and I it was something I kind of fought about back then you know was kind of trying to you know and it, but it was something now that I'm seeing my students coming into a completely different world mm -hmm. in design and that's exciting to me you know that's and it really, helps make it that way that's really cool so Good thing we're progressing as humans, so yay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, did you find it like hard being a female? Because um, I know a lot of females, even right now, who had really bad experiences working in a company. Um, intentionally or unintentionally, they have experienced sexism. Have you experienced something like that before? I would, I go back really to before I was in the toy business and I worked in advertising and this mm -hmm. was like in my twenties. And I think now about things that were said to me that I think, oh my God, I can't believe it's like, <laughs> no one would say that now. They would never say that. You know, <laughs> the stupid things that men would say, you know, and I, at that time it annoyed me, but I didn't say much, you know, I just kind of tried to like ignore it. Or just, it was the kind of thing where I'm so glad to see that people don't have to keep their mouths shut. You know, people, can, <laughs> I never had anything, anything like violent or anything really bad. It was just really stupid. So, <laughs> really like, oh, come on. But, you know, the funny one was like the one I just told you about the, I've never hired a woman before. But the interesting thing is, in spite of those stereotypical kinds of gender things that went on in the toy business, there were a lot of opportunities for women. Once I got into that world, I never felt like that held me back. Being a woman did not hold me back at all. So that, I think that we were progressing in that way by then. That's really awesome. I feel like a lot of females, um, mostly a lot of the females I know, they kind of lack self-esteem. Um, do you have any like tips for them or advice? if they want to pursue something? Hmm. I feel like by the time I, like we're talking mid eighties, there were so many women that were going into management, you know? And then there was, I would say though, that I felt that a lot of men resented those women if they came off as super powerful, you know? And I mean, so they I, still do. <laughs> I know. And so I observed that double standard, even now to our current elections, you know, it was like, <laughs> When a woman asserts herself or comes off as being in charge, it's not viewed in the same way. And I mean, that was very clear back then, but it's still, I felt like there's room for me to, I didn't feel held back. I have to honestly say, I think maybe I've been really fortunate in that way. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as like advice, I just think practice speaking up. I mean, you know, do it um, around your friends when you're trying to assert an idea but I think for a lot of us, it's just hard to speak our truth, you might say. And I think it's just practice doing it in a small way. And, you know, just believe in your the thing that you care about. I mean, if you are really bring love and passion to your work, believe in that. And mm -hmm. as you start to present that in the world, I think try to keep an open mind to, you know, you, one, in one way you don't want to be waiting for someone to say, oh, that's so good, you know, to validate you in that way. And yet, I think when you put it out there, it's surprising how much positive can come back to you. So try to come at it with a very positive point of view. What I'm doing is worth being seen. And sometimes you have to start small, you know, just a little at a time. Does that make sense? It does, that's really great advice. Um, I always believe like passion can help you like feel more confident because like yes. you said, the more you do it, um, but then the, the practicing of standing up for yourself is really difficult. Like even me, I, I have to bite my tongue so many times because I feel like, oh, I shouldn't say this, blah, blah, blah. So I, I, I really liked your advice about speaking up and practicing from like a small group and yeah. standing your ground. That's really important. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Besides that one comment your old boss said to you, do you have any other interesting stories you would like to share? <laughs> Um, well, you know, I would just say that you never know what doors can open. You know, I think the toy business in a funny way led to doing some very, very different things for me. And I just, you know, when I talk to students, I always say, just be ready, you know, just be ready for anything. You can be working in a, what seems like a really dumb job, but a door may open. I'll just give you two examples. And that one is uh, when I was at Mattel, 
but it was during toy fair. So none of the management was around, but a friend of mine had said, you know, you should talk to the Mars Explorer people. And he, he was somebody he knew. He worked at JPL and he says, you should talk to Dr. Shake. He's the director of public outreach at, at uh, uh, JPL. And, you know, they're developing the, the Mars Rover. I think he would really like to talk to someone in the toy business. And he said, really? You know, and then there's that little part of me that thinks, well, I'm just Virginia Hine. I'm just this designer, but what the heck? I'll call him. And he was so nice. He was like, oh, I've been wanting to make a connection with Mattel for so long. And I thought, oh, okay. And he, so I'd love to invite you to come see the prototype of the Mars rover. Uh, okay, can I bring any? Oh yeah, bring as many. It was amazing. You know, later I found out someone else had been trying to make that connection. I don't know why that didn't happen, but I called up my boss who was in New York, and he says, "Just go, just go, just round up some people and go." So we did, and uh, you know that was so exciting to get the little tour, and it was just amazing to get to see things, you know, the, and, and talk to him about the space program. Dr. Sheikh was a, he was from Mali. He later became, believe it or not, the president of Mali for a brief time. But he told me about being a child in Mali and looking up at the stars and dreaming of being an astronaut. And there was just a really wonderful connection. Who would have expected a thing like that from working in the toy business? But you know, it was the fact that I worked for Mattel there was this possibility of making a t connection, which did go on. Um, and it, so, and some years later, I was working for another toy company, and someone called up and was looking for a friend of mine who was out that day. And I said, "Oh well, I know where she lives. I'll I can I'll get in touch with her." And she says, "Well, what do you do?" And I started telling her. She says, "Well, I'm looking for someone to work on a license for the Vatican Library." Whoa. Thought, Whoa. Okay. And she, she, I said, well, you know, I'll get in touch with my friend. She says, well, really, I think there's work for more than one person. Okay. So my friend and I ended up working for a project that was the, a Vatican library license. And that was actually a project I worked on for five years. And it led to trips to Rome and doing this amazing all concept stuff. Mm -hmm. And there I was, you know, in a job where I'm making little plastic doodads for a job. And then I'm coming home and I'm designing concepts for furniture and crystal and uh, all kinds of, you name it, consumer wallpapers, just in doing room scenes. And I had to figure out how to do a room scene. You know, I mean, you just never know. You just never know what doors will open. And I feel like I've been super lucky that way. And the well, only you're also I really do, good too. So I don't think yeah. it's just luck. <laughs> well, thank you. But you know, a lot of it, there's a lot of stuff I've done that I didn't know if I could do it, but somebody said, well, could you do this? I think, well, I'll give it a try. Sure. You know, it sounds interesting. I, I think this is like another really good tip then. It's basically, you're saying whenever an opportunity comes, even though you're not sure about it, you should always go for it. Right. Yep. <laughs> A nutshell. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you're right too, because like you feel like um, when you do work a job, it's just gonna be this way, but you never realize all the like really cool stuff that might happen on the side because you meet so many people. Unimaginable things, really. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It's really awesome. So okay, then what was your favorite toy that you designed? <laughs> hmm. Well, okay, I would say probably my favorite was, uh, this was long after I left Mattel and I was doing a lot of uh, soft goods plush design on a licensing basis. And I came up, up with a fashion cat. Ooh. She's a cat, but she's a fashion doll, but she's a cat. <laughs> so it's not Hello Kitty, it's very different. <laughs> she has big clunky feet so she could stand. And her name was, it was Kitty Tood. And that was the only time I ever went through a process of uh, trademarking and really seeing something that I designed exactly as I envisioned it sitting at Toy Fair. So I have to say that was my favorite. And she had a pretty good run for about three years. I met somebody recently who said, 
oh, I had that when I was a child. I was like, oh, that's so exciting. <laughs> so You're looking so at the cool designer. It's <laughs> yeah. like, wow, you actually had that. Okay, cool. <laughs> that's really cool. And um, so artists, I feel like, are also pretty generally progressive. Do you feel like um, you guys fought to be more progressive in the toy industry? Like, um, do you feel like it kind of influenced it? Because you did say that marketing kind of has more control over the general stuff, right? And I'm wondering, like, us as artists, do you feel like we kind of have a little bit of power to change things a little bit? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's really the progressive ideas are usually coming from the artists. You know, they're yeah. coming from the creative side. And sometimes you have people who are not necessarily the artists that have a vision but, you know, it's the artists that really bring it to life or and are often it, are the ones that bring the vision. And I've seen that even recently with one of my former students. It's very much that. It's exactly what you said. I mean, and so there's, in order to get it out there, you have to have that person who has the marketing know-how in order mm -hmm. to, for it to see the light of day. So when those two sides, you might say, can work together in a you know, a common kind of partnership, that's the best. Mm -hmm. That's really great. Um, thanks for sharing that. And yeah, I feel like um, even though we're just drawing, drawing pictures, I feel like we do have a lot of influence over it. So artists, let's keep pushing the, for the world to be better. <laughs> so oh, 100%. Yeah. 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 What does it mean to be an artist like to you? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> It's a big question. I think, you know, even when I was a child, I imagined doing all kinds of things, you know, and I think being an artist takes so many forms. And I, I've always thought of myself as an artist, even though I don't always think I'm doing art. You know, I often am not at all sure that what I do is art, but I really value that whole process of making something, of mm -hmm. having a vision or trying to bring a vision into some kind of life and what I also love is not always having a clear picture of something at the start. I'm in love with the process of making or doing and that some part of you can allow something to happen if you just get in and work and see where the work takes you. Does that make sense? I hope yeah. that makes sense. It's, it does. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people imagine that to be an artist, you have to have a fully formed vision. It's like you have to have the Sistine, Sistine Chapel in your brain before you, and I don't think that's true. <laughs> uh, I could start barely piece very, together yeah, what yeah, I'm going mean, to have I, for lunch. So I, I, mean, like, yeah. I think you can start with kind of a simple thing. And just as you get into it, and as you have faith in the process, it's going to take you somewhere. And you usually can tell because it feels really good. You get into a, a flow, a feeling of, hmm, I think I might be onto something. I don't care what this looks like to somebody else right now. I think I'm on to something and I'm just going to keep at it. When you love that feeling, I don't know, that's to me what being an artist is. And I think we also really love to share that with, we want the world to eventually see that. I think that's part of it. It's interesting you say that. I feel like most people, when they see a really nice painting, they're just like, oh, it looks nice. They don't understand like the journey you went through for each painting, at least for me. I always go through like an ugly phase of my art. Oh yeah. And I'm just like, oh, totally. oh my God, I should just quit right now. This looks so bad. And That's um, so true. Yeah. So and true. it's so hard to push yourself through that. So it's really cool that you view like being an artist, that whole process of making an art piece. I actually never thought about it like it's that. It's like a verb, you know, it's <laughs> being an artist is not a noun. It's a verb. How do you like that? <laughs> I don't think I ever thought of that before, but as we're talking, that's what it seems like to me. That's really cool. Well, has it changed throughout your art journey then, like your perception of being an artist? Sure. I mean, I, I do think that I used to feel like, say, what I would do when I was at Mattel as a job was completely different than when I'd come home and I'd start to do something from, you know, I'd be doing some, working on some painting. And I felt like I have my fine art self and I have this part that is using art to make things in a company, but I don't feel that separation. I mean, for one thing, I'm not in that position anymore, but I, I think especially as teaching is that no matter whether I was teaching students at Otis to become toy designers or working with adults who are just trying to find their own voice again after many years or, or just find some direction, 
I found it was the same thing. I felt the principles were the same, you know, and it's it. Then I started to realize this is just not that different. Mm -hmm. It's just not as different as I thought it was. That's really cool. You said that you liked drawing and painting more, right? Did you ever feel like you wished you left your career sooner? Like, you, you know what I mean? Did you wish you just left and painted full time, I guess? Oh, well, that's kind of funny because I realized for a long time, I thought that's all I want to do. I just want to do my own drawing and painting. That's all I want to do. And teaching changed that completely because now it's like right now I do have the time and opportunity to sort of just do my own thing and it's not enough I have a real need to teach you know mm -hmm. and that teach is about communication it's about what students give you mm -hmm. and it's about you know it's kind of goes back and forth back and forth it's a conversation teaching is always a, a two-way conversation to me and and that's so important so uh, just the idea of just doing my own thing doesn't feel as much like what I want to do as I thought it did. Hmm, that's interesting. Okay, so you seem to enjoy teaching like a lot. What are some of the things you've learned from your students? Well, I feel like it's so huge that it's hard to put into words. Um, <laughs> I, I know uh, people don't believe this, but I would say about the first two years I worked at Otis, I was terrified. I would have to psych myself up every day to go in and not, and just, you know, kind of do it right, I guess. And I, I guess I thought I was going to make a terrible mistake. I'm sure I made a whole bunch of mistakes, but. Uh, you're a really great teacher. I've, I've seen you teach before. Well, thank <laughs> you. But I had to get through some serious fear. It just, at some point I lost the fear when I think I'm so excited to see what people do. And especially when I think about my Otis students. I'm there to help them build skills and build their language, you know, their mm -hmm. visual language so that they can express something or, you know, just get their ideas across. But I am amazed at the world they bring. I mean, especially as I'm like a couple of generations older than they are. It's like I get to see things from their point of view that are just, wow, that's amazing. That's so interesting. And I've even seen things change, you know, things coming in waves over the years as far as where the students are in, in a sort of general way. That's fascinating to me. I get so many insights from them that I wouldn't have access to. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and, you know, when you teach and you know this, you have to find some clarity you have to find a way it's so hard <laughs> it's hard <laughs> yeah, it's really it's hard not the same as being an artist it's yeah. like because you know whatever it is that you didn't say like you know when the work comes back and you look at it and you go whoa I didn't know that's what I asked for <laughs> okay that's rethink so that took quite a while and you know every class is different and all that but you have to learn to clarify and so I realized I'm telling them that my job is to help you get your ideas across. But if it forces me to keep having to clarify, what is it that I'm really trying to get across? <laughs> what is it that's important here? Yeah. You know, what is it that's going to be helpful to this person? And it might be very different than that person sitting next to them. And the more I do it, the more it's like a fine tuning. You know, it's like listening, like be a good listener and figure out what is it that this person needs to kind of help them take a step, not necessarily to what I imagine is good, but what is the best thing for them, mm -hmm. you know? And then when you see someone kind of bloom into their own, that is the most exciting thing ever. You know? I agree. <laughs> I agree with that. <laughs> You're a giver. <laughs> That's awesome. How has teaching shaped who you are today then? Well, like I said, it just makes me aware that when you really love something, you love that process of doing and making and seeing something come into being. And even though it goes to that ugly stage, which it often does for me, and sometimes <laughs> it's hard to get it out of that stage, you know, but it doesn't, in a way, the more you do it, the less that matters. And it's just that process of, of doing, you want to share that. I mean, it's mm -hmm. exciting to, and then you, you know, you're aware as you meet people, you know, as a, when you're out on location, some people are just kind of curious and they walk over and see what you're doing. And then you often meet people who are so taken with what you're doing. And it's because their heart is pulling them in your direction. They want to do this. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, okay, that's time to really engage and just see what is it that 
is going on here? I mean, that's what I always felt with students is let's find out what's going on here. I mean, I know there's something trying to, to emerge <laughs> and I, I love that. I love, I've learned that that's more interesting to me than I still would love to just sit and draw, but I really love that seeing what comes out of other people. That's yeah. just a lot of fun. <laughs> that, that is, and that's really, that's really cool. I wish I had you as a teacher. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so oh, um, Michelle just wanted to say that when she started teaching, um, so we teach kind of together, uh -huh. I, at least for me, the first day I taught, my hand was like shaking and I was like, I, I couldn't even talk normally. And then Michelle said she also had that fear as well. Oh, so gosh. it's so, I felt that way. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, that's, oh my God, I, I don't want to remember that. But, okay, so um, how long have you been doing urban sketching and location sketching or plain air painting? Ah, okay. You know, I always had a sketchbook with me if I went on a trip. Yeah. And, but I never showed anybody because for one thing, it was, you know, when you're in a design business, your sketches are just for you, pretty much. You know, it's your thinking. So the idea of doing something that's not going to be something you go back and refine to show people. That was something kind of new for me. I didn't really get serious about what we'll call location sketching until I joined the Huntington's Garden Arts Guild. And I heard about that when I left my job at Mattel. And that would have been, I guess, 97. And a friend of mine told me about it. And I thought, Garden Arts Guild, that sounds kind of corny. But I thought... I really want to do that. So, you know, that was great because I got to go when they weren't open, you know, to the public. And I just fell in love with sitting and drawing with only the sound of wind and carp, you know, in the stream or whatever. And it was at the Huntington. I thought, this is amazing. And I started doing that a lot. And that was kind of a transition when I started to uh, just sketch in more urban scenes, and it was around the early part of 2009, I discovered the Urban Sketcher blog. Oh. And that was like, boom, the lights came on. That was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> this is people all over the world going out and just drawing in their cities. And the interesting thing is that I always say Urban Sketchers is the most democratic organization you will ever find because <laughs> there's no style. I mean, there's so many artists and urban sketchers I just so admire. Such a range from very, very refined, detailed work to very, very expressive, just almost abstract, and yet it's very true to the place and everything in between. I loved that range. And give props to Gabby Campanario, who started that. And he is a reportage artist, reportage artist in Oregon. He's from Spain originally. And he started the blog and he really started kind of recruiting people. And I didn't meet him face to face until years later. Mm -hmm. So this was an online community for me for a couple of years. I was following people and felt like I knew them, but didn't meet any other urban sketchers face to face for a few years. And it was changing my life because I was out all the time with my sketchbook and I began to see the sketchbook as an art form in itself that was very different than the way I thought about sketching before mm -hmm. you know and I came to prize things that look kind of rough again and when you're in a industry where things need to be very polished you know a lot of the rough edges I would had to kind of leave behind and I was so happy to get to just do something that had some rough edges again. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. You know, does. and that's part of urban sketchers is just very direct. It's very right what you're seeing right now and you try and and a lot of urban sketchers are everything from very elegant European architects doing beautiful drawings of buildings to some of my friends in New York who are reportage artists who who were trained as that in New York and are just doing amazing expressive work. I got to admire some artists in Singapore that I was just crazy about their work and Don Lowe and Tia Boon Sim. And when I finally got to go to Singapore to get to meet those people and, you know, and then you know how artists love to nerd out over materials? Oh, like, yes. Oh, what kind of pen is that? 
it's so cool when you're doing this like with an international community, you know, like I just fell in love with a certain type of pen because Tia Boon Sim draws with it and Don Lowe does. And it's like, when you finally get to meet these people, it's the weirdest thing. You feel like, I feel like I know you. And they'd say the same thing. I feel like I know you and it's because <laughs> you've been following their work for so long. So I do believe it's life changing and getting to go do uh, teach in symposiums. This has just been pretty amazing. That's really cool. So what has your involvement been with the Urban Sketchers? Like, do you help them with events? Um, we, we taught a workshop together for Urban Sketchers, yes, right? Yeah, sure so that did. was awesome. Is there anything, like, how do you get involved with the group? Well, we have an LA group, as you know, and I'm one of the administrators, although I'm sure I do the least as the administrator, <laughs> but I do classes and I'm also on the education committee. So basically our committee reviews all workshop proposals. And mm. right now there's not a lot going on, but we always review hundreds of proposals for the international symposiums. The education committee, although I don't take personal credit for that at all, uh, it, it was Mario who came up with that, that um, the 10 by 10, which was what how you and I taught together. So it was basically a way to do long uh, workshops or a 10, a 10 session workshop where you could really develop a series of workshops. And that was kind of new for Urban Sketchers. That was and really a fun. Worldwide effort. So I hope we get to do that again. Yeah. Darn yeah. COVID. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, what are some of the valuable lessons you learned from your fellow urban sketchers or sketching events? Mm, I, I think it's just, as I was saying, it's that learning to just, you know, even when I see these really elegant drawings by the architects, when you look closely, it's like you see the hand, you know, you see that the drawing is always a working drawing. And it's not like somebody's going back and refining and doing layer upon layer until it looks, has a certain level of polish. It's very right now. It's drawing what you see right now. And I, I really learned to just kind of love your own line. And I love a sketchbook. I love the idea that if I do a crappy sketch, I can turn the page. You know, <laughs> maybe I can come back to it and slap something on it and rework it. But more often than not, it's like, okay, turn the page. and just try another one. There's so many different approaches. You know, I might get used to always doing something in a certain way and someone else has this completely different way of working. I think, hmm, that would be interesting to try. And there is just a real feeling of uh, sharing, such a feeling of sharing ideas that are, and just so different. You know? That's really cool. Since you guys go out to sketch a lot and you guys interact a lot, have there been any like funny or interesting memorable um, encounters you guys had when you were out sketching um I'm sure there are and I'm not thinking <laughs> of right now in Los Angeles but I'll just briefly tell you the the one that always takes the cake for me was my very first time teaching at a symposium was in Barcelona in 2013 jealous <laughs> and yes well oh my god I love Barcelona so I love much. Barcelona that was my third workshop. So I figured by the time I did the third workshop, I've got this down. I know what I'm doing. Okay. So we go out there and we're out in a harbor area. And I had noticed that the harbor in Barcelona, you don't see any railings anywhere. And I thought you would never visit a place like this in the United States that wouldn't have railings. And I thought, gosh, I wonder if anybody ever falls overboard. But then I didn't really think about it after that. So as our group was going to our site, there was this guy kind of wandering around behind us. And it turns out he was kind of like really drunk as a skunk. And the next thing we knew, when, when I was in the middle of doing my demo, I, you know, you heard the splash. And oh then my God. he's yelling. And then I turned around and there's all these people like laying down, looking down in the water. And this guy is flailing in the water and it didn't take long before you see the trucks come up and it's the policia and they're throwing ropes in and then that misses and he's still floating and it <laughs> and all this time I'm like my easel and I have these people who I feel like okay they've paid to have a workshop here should I be trying to help get that guy out <laughs> no I think the police have that covered and then 
somebody who's very famous in urban sketchers is Le Pen. He's a artist, a French artist who lives in Barcelona. He was documenting the whole thing. He was drawing the whole scene with the guy yelling in the water and everything. And I just kind of went blank for a minute. I just like, I didn't know what to do. And somebody said, what kind of pencil is that? <laughs> Oh, oh my god <laughs> priorities and i love that that's like the standard question no matter what you're trying to say somebody will say what kind of pencil or what kind of brand of paint are you using or whatever but it's like it snapped me back into reality it's like okay th this situation will be okay but you know oh my gosh that was so crazy you know that's just really interesting running around taking pictures and i'm just trying to talk about you know what we came to talk about <laughs> anyway so that I love to say when you're out painting in the street or certainly teaching in the street you never know what will happen yep so, that's for yeah. sure <laughs> so you've been to a lot of places like to teach and sketch which one's your favorite and where do you want to go back to after this whole COVID thing's gone I'll tell you the truth the place I am most looking forward to is my own city. You know, mm -hmm. I love Los Angeles. I am a native born Angelino and <laughs> I can't wait till I can go back to my favorite places in Los Angeles, like Alvera Street or the downtown market or just Echo Park. A lot of places that I'm just really looking forward to being able to relax and be in those places and draw again. Even places that I didn't know I would care about, you fall in love with them when you're there and you start drawing or painting those places. It totally transforms it for you. That's true. Yeah, I, I can't wait to just eat at a restaurant, to be honest. I know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's just to be able to relax, you know, around <laughs> people again would be really nice. You yeah. Know? Um, so you have done a lot, quite a lot of workshops. Have you discovered like a efficient way to do location sketching for workshops? Well, like on um, the ideal length, the right amount of people. Yeah, I don't know why in urban sketchers and in other places, there's this sort of magic number of three hours and <laughs> 15 people. I, I don't know how that happened, but I, um, I know that I need at least three hours. I've tried doing two hour workshops and that's just not enough. And I really love doing a series. Hmm. I love, um, you know, you, in a three hour workshop, there's always a tendency to want to, want to cram a lot in it when you're able to do a series it's just so nice because then there's you can build some continuity and i've always wanted to do my own weekend workshop and that is something i totally am looking forward to after the pandemic hmm. you know, i've been scheduled to do that in a couple of places and of course was not able to do it so but we will we'll get to do <laughs> that eventually and um, I like actually a smaller number. I think like 12 is a really good number. I think when you get to have a lot more than that, it's just hard to, you know, you, you really want people to feel comfortable with sharing with each other. Yeah. Because they're learning from each other, not just from you. 12 is kind of a nice number, I think. I agree with you. Like every time I choose to teach a class, I always want it to be smaller so I could give like individual attention to everyone. Because mm -hmm. like you said earlier, when you're teaching, you have one way to talk to this student, but like another way to talk to this other one. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's, I think that's really cool that you will, you teach small workshops. <laughs> and even, you know, I'm still kind of pondering the best way to do something online. I know that's what I want to do. I don't want to have a giant online workshop. It's no, don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so after all talking about your urban sketching and everything, um, have you, do you feel like you're, toy and product design experience has transferred over to your location sketching? Hmm, that's such a good question. You know, it, it's funny, the two things that I sort of specialized in in toys were characters, like doll characters, and environments, like castles or you name it. That's pretty much what I draw. I don't know how many tree houses over the years besides castles and that sort of thing, but drawing people and environments was what I always did. And it's what I do now. So in this funny way, hmm, there does seem to be a connection. Yeah. I feel like um, my entertainment job also helps me with like landscape painting. It's really, and then of course they help each other out. So it's really cool. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you seem like a very accomplished designer and like a teacher. What's one accomplishment that you're like the most proud of? 
Well, uh, you know, the first thing I think of when you say that is what I feel proud of. I don't know. I don't think about accomplishment, but what I feel proud of is every year we have senior show and I walk around and I, you know, I never had my own kids, but I see what the students have done, you know, as a culmination in their senior show. And I feel so proud. <laughs> and I know it doesn't have a lot to do with me. I mean, sometimes there a student will acknowledge my part in it, but I just feel so proud that to see the students sort of get it together and start to, and even, you know, they haven't even graduated fully yet, but they've already started to have a real clear sense of who they are and they're putting it out there for the world to see. And I, I just feel incredibly proud when I see that. And then I think how that translates when I'm working with say older adults is it's that same thing when they start to overcome fear and they start to discover what it is they really want to do you know it's I always stress the idea of it's about your ideas it's about what do you want to express what do you choose to look at that's what's important here and when I see them do that I get really excited you know then I feel proud if I had a hand in that uh, um, personally speaking just getting to know you I feel like you're one of those teachers who can really change someone's life. Like I had a few teachers in my life who really changed my thought. I feel like you're totally one of those. So I feel like you definitely had a huge hand in helping develop an artistic voice. I'm sure of that. Well, that's so kind of you. I, I hope you're right. <laughs> that would mean a lot to me. I hope you're right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so um, we hear from many artists who lament they don't have an artist community to go out sketching or painting with, how would you advise them to either find one or form one of their own? You know, I think it's kind of interesting. Most artists, including me, are, I would say, more on the introverted side. Most artists are not super extroverted, or they maybe wouldn't be artists. There's probably an exception to that. <laughs> but most of us are on the more introverted side. So sort of just starting a big group right off the bat is kind of a that's that's a tough one or even joining a group might even seem like a challenge but you know I like I said I discovered an online community before I started doing this around other people I think that's a good place to start is we have so much online right now in terms of the community of artists and just starting to put stuff out there you make connections that way as you well know and I think if you're somewhere where there's not an active group, I think just start, again, start small, you know, just find somebody that wants to just go out and draw or go out and paint. And you just, it could be just a couple of people. And I think it can grow very organically that way. I, I don't think you necessarily have to start up putting an ad in the paper and gathering a, a huge group, you know, <laughs> it can start really small. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and as far as, you know, I meet people all the time who say, you know, I really want to get back into doing art but I haven't done it for so long and and I of course I always tell them about urban sketchers and I always say you know you don't have to be a pro I mean we all learn from each other and so I just always like to encourage people that no matter where you think you are in a in this art journey is please feel like you've got something to offer just by you know your presence and coming along and and just give it a shot you know yeah um, so I, I feel like um, with Warrior Painters, we've been really lucky to have people like Michelle, Kaylee, Larry, because um, they kind of helped us form this group. I did kind of start the group, but I feel like they kind of evolved this group into something completely different. Do you also feel like it's important to have like people that you're close to within a group, like to form this kind of partnership? Yeah. I know for like Urban Sketchers, right, you guys must have like several admins. So... Oh, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Urban Sketchers would not work in as, organiz as an organization if there weren't a ton of people. You know, nobody gets paid. It's volunteer, you know, and, <laughs> and there's a lot of people who put their, we just put a lot of time and effort into it just to, you know, see it grow and be part of a community. And it yeah. becomes just something you want to do to support the community. Yeah, it's, it's, I, every time I see your guys' posts on Facebook, I'm always like, oh my God, that's really cool. And it's really inspiring too. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. And I just hope everyone feels like they're totally welcome. You know? 
Um, I actually have one last question that I would like sure. to ask you. So um, how did you kind of stop caring about like, um, remember how you said in the beginning um, when you're working, it's like you only get 25% of what you worked on in a product. Do you have any advice on like kind of how to get over that pain? Because even for me right now, sometimes I'm designing stuff. I'm like, oh man, this looks like so cool. I can't wait to see this in the show. But then the show happens and it's completely changed. And sometimes it kind of breaks my heart. Do you have any advice for like artists that are just starting off in the industry wow. on how to get over that? <sighs> That's <it. laughs> I honestly think you, you know, I'm sorry, but when you really care, it's going to hurt a little bit. <laughs> it's just, I think if you get to the point where you really could care less, it ceased to be something you have any passion about. But I would say that for me, as long as I was working in-house in the company and I was involved with all, you know, different phases, even though I always worked at the preliminary design mm -hmm. end of things. So things would go through a lot of changes. Even if it was sort of my idea that got out there, it would look quite different. But you just start to begin to see, you know what, everybody who's putting their hands on this, it's, they become part of it. And you have to start to see it as a collaboration. An interesting thing is, is one of the things I notice about my students, it's, mm -hmm. I kind of think it's generational, is uh, I think of my Otis students, I think collaboration, they get it. I mean, they are, it, for them, it's so much easier to understand this idea of collaborating and they seem to be a little, most of them are a little bit better at not feeling like they have to do everything themselves mm -hmm, as mm -hmm. sort of older people in this business, you know. I like seeing that collaboration and accepting different points of view is a mm -hmm. real strong suit with that generation, I think. I just think that's part of it is know that when you go into a business like this, I think that's how you have to look at it. It's a collaboration. It's, it's just not going to be about you. Mm -hmm. painfully at times <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay I'll remind myself of that too thank you yeah collaboration um, that's the word right <laughs> yeah we're, we're so we're practically at the end of the general questions that I wanted to ask you so we do have a few um, audience questions if you're ready for them sure okay the first question that someone is asking is they said I have your urban sketching book and I love the way you work uh, what materials do you take with you when you go out sketching? There's three parts to this question, so I'll ask you that question. Okay. Right. Um, so when they say they have my book, I wonder if they mean the landscape sketching book. But um, that, I, I, you know, I always have kind of a small, um, kind of eight by five, I guess you could say, watercolor sketchbook. That goes with me everywhere. I always have a bag of pencils. I have my fountain pens. And I have some ink washes that are in water brushes. Uh, and I have a little, very small watercolor palette. And that's my basic set. That mm -hmm. goes with me everywhere. And if I have more time, you know, if I know I'm going with a dedicated purpose, I will take larger sketchbooks, maybe a watercolor block. And then I'll take a bigger palette and my real brushes. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. Um, how often do you sketch outdoors? Almost every day. Really? Um, Even right now? Oh, <laughs> oh you said you just go to your front yard, right? Oh, well, yeah. My front right, right now, my front yard has to count. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I do, you know, I might now and then I'll miss a day of drawing, but if I'm not doing something in the studio, which most of the time, even if it's just go outside and do a quick sketch, it's just something I need to do. You're like addicted, right? <laughs> yeah, in a yeah. good way, I think, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> Um, do you use a small journal and do you elaborate upon your work when you get back to your studio? Oh, really good question. Um, that's part of, for me, the on location process is occasionally I'll come back and I'll think, hmm, I think I need to add some more darks or whatever, or add a little more definition, but I very rarely do that unless I'm in the situation. I, I would even rather go back to the same location if I can if I feel like something's not finished. And I actually did that this week. Oh, you're so dedicated. I'm, I'm too lazy to do that. Well, I honestly, you know, and people often say, oh, do you ever take pictures and then work from the photo when you get back? And I would say, no, because if I take a photo, I will go, whoa, I really got it wrong. <laughs> because let's face it, a photo sees it, it things completely differently than our eye does. 
And I really need to stay in the, well, what was it that I felt like I had to draw? Or what <laughs> was it that I, you know, that I saw at the time? And it's not necessarily what the camera sees. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be too tempted to try to adjust it to the camera eye. Mm. So I try, most of the time, I kind of figure it is what it is, or else I'll go back and work more on it. Mm. I remember reading about how Monet would bring like seven canvases with him, because he would paint like every 15 minutes as it changes, he would bring out the next canvas wow. to paint. Yeah, so. Who was that? Monet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so mm. I think that's really cool that you actually go back. And you're right, the camera really does changes a lot of things. So it's it's really important to just sometimes go back to the same location to capture that feeling. And hopefully it's the same time of day. Yeah. Exactly. Well, Monet did that, I'm sure, right? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, could you uh, elaborate a bit on the um, Urban Sketcher Symposium? Um, what is it and what events go on? Favorite ones you've attended? Um, I've always been fortunate to attend them as an instructor. So, you know, I don't even know what it feels like so much to be on the other side of that, except that all four of the ones I went to, I absolutely loved. Very, very different. And what it is, it is an annual, except for this year, <laughs> it's been an annual event. I think the first one I want to say was 2009, perhaps, maybe. And it is international. And it's kind of like uh, the Olympics, where cities vie to, they put in proposals to get to do the next symposium. Are you and serious? That's really so cool. Big deal. Like the big deal <laughs> is when they announce at the end of a symposium, where it's going to be, where's, and if people are saying, oh, I think it's going to be here. No, it's going to be there. Oh, where do you think it's going to be? Oh, big. And then they announce it and it's such a big deal. It's like, oh, lights are flashing. I mean, it's so cool, you know? So the last one I went to was last year in Amsterdam and they, the big announcement was Hong Kong and oh my gosh, oh. it was so exciting. Well, sadly, we didn't get to do it in Hong Kong. And I think the first one, that I taught at, I think we had 16 workshops and the last 16, few, 16 over a period of, it was three or four days. Oh my and, God. <laughs> but participants, I, I think you got four, you got to take four workshops over a period of several days. And then there were events in the evening. There were speakers, there's all, you know, demos. So every year has been a little bit of an experiment They've tried doing other kinds of things besides workshops. We got, I think, in, by the time we did Singapore in 2015, there was so much going on that we didn't fill up the workshops, which was new. And so they tried to make it a little more focused. But the last two that I've taught at were Chicago and Amsterdam. And I think there were 30, 30 or 32 different workshops. And the participants sign up for three. So, you know, it's tough because they're all good. I'm excited because I get to see all the proposals and, you know, we have so many. They're pretty good. <laughs> they're, I mean, they're all quite good. Very diverse. Workshops are generally three hours, but then they have what they call sketch crawls in the afternoon. There's usually the famous drink and draw at night <laughs> where there's usually some place that kind of gets taken over where people sit and draw a lot of time they're drawing each other and so it's kind of like from morning to night you're with these people drawing 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 it's pretty fun that sounds like a dream <laughs> <laughs> so much fun <laughs> that's awesome um okay so when you're doing these urban sketching what on um, when you're starting to make it what is the first thing you try to focus on? Well, the thing that always interests me the most personally is trying to get a feel for the place. So when I'm in a place, I kind of, I always walk around. And then when I sit down where I want to sketch, it's like, I, I'm not just looking, you know, I'm kind of getting like, what kind of a place does this feel like? Are there a ton of people, you know, just what's kind of the energy and I'm looking at the light. So you know, I'm kind of taking in a lot. And then it's like, oftentimes, what is that thing that grabs my attention? And I try to kind of consciously be aware of what that is. And then depending on how much time I have, you know, it kind of just makes me decide like what materials I'm going to use, or what the approach is I'm going to take. 
Mm -hmm. And it's just, I try to get a sense of, I, I guess I'll call it story. I think urban sketchers are very big on delivering something of a story of a place, even if it is just about the way the light is hitting a building, you know, they're telling a story about it. You know, it's, it's always an interpretation. Yeah. So it's like, what, what is for me, it's like, what is the story here? And what is it that really draws me that I want to focus on? That's really cool. Um, so when you guys are doing the symposiums, then I feel like that's really cool how you could see each artist's story then, right? Yes. Yeah. That Absolutely. must be really fun to kind of like bounce your ideas off of each other. So that's, that is really the fun of it. I think. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So um, someone asked, do you also set a timer when you go outside to paint? No, that might be a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Well, really, I mean, I'm one of those people that if I have to wait in line, like right now we do a bit of waiting in line, if I'm standing at Costco line, I draw my shoppers, the shoppers in front of me with the big carts, you know, I mean, if I have 15 minutes that I have to wait, I will get my sketchbook out. So that becomes a timer in itself. Mm -hmm. If like I've been doing lately, if I have time to go to Descanso Gardens and I can just sit there until it gets too blasted hot or whatever, and I just love the fact that I can sit there and draw as long as I want. It's interesting about the timing. I think it's often the situation creates a time. Mm -hmm. you know, if you're with a group, that becomes a certain time because usually the group will say, okay, we're going to meet at a certain time. And so you try to have something kind of finished by then. You know, So in a sense, that's a time. I, I never thought about it like that. That's interesting. <laughs> um, okay, so... This is kind of related to the previous two questions, but um, what do you do for if some reason your sketch is not coming out as you expect it? Do you quit and start another one or do you work on it and try to fix it? I remember earlier you said that you could just turn a page, but um, when do you usually, like, how do you approach this besides sometimes turning the page? That is such a great question. You know, I do both. And sometimes I will just, it's just something in me that doesn't like to give up. And I'll just keep working on something. I'll just beat it till it's dead sometimes, you know, and <laughs> okay, move on. But, you know, every once in a while, I, I just look at something and I don't have to go very far into it before I know, you know what, this is not going to work. Uh, <laughs> I'm turning the page and maybe I'll come back. I know some of you, some of your audience might know Liz Steele. Liz Steele's pretty well known in the urban sketcher community. And I've been out sketching with her and she goes out always with, a glue stick and some scraps of paper. And I did something that was just crap when I was sitting there with her and she said, oh, she hands me the glue stick and the paper and I thought, okay. And I just slapped that piece of paper down on the ugly <laughs> thing that I just knew I couldn't make work. Well, what a smart idea. And I liked that it was even not trying to hide it as much. It was like a yellow or something. It was like a color. But I, that just gave me like a whole fresh, well, I'm just going to keep drawing now. And I, I loved that. That was not something I'd done before. You know, that is a thing that's not an uncommon thing to do. I just had never done it before. And now it makes me realize, oh, now I see why she sticks tickets and maps and things in her sketches. Sometimes it's covering up something. Okay, ah, I did not know that. Oh. So it, that was kind of funny. But anyway, I... Oftentimes, I will just try to keep working until it turns into something, and then I can still dislike it, and I just have to turn the page. Hmm. And I just, one of the things that when sketching is a daily practice, you don't get as attached to if everything you do isn't just exactly the way you hoped it would be. It's okay. Just keep going. You know, what could I learn from that? At what point did I go, you know, I really went off the deep end? at what point did that happen and often now because I teach I'm taking pictures of things mm -hmm. at certain stages sometimes I know exactly when I just went too far but I always think it's better to push it over the edge than to be afraid so I often will just keep working to see what would happen if you know what would happen if I just did this to it now that's a really good it. point. I, I'm going to try to bring a glue stick and some paper with me when I go plain our painting. Now. I mean, wow, what, a, what an idea. That's really smart. And then, um, yeah, I agree. Sometimes I do like to take pictures of my progress as well, because um, you can analyze why you messed up. So it's cool that you do that. Too. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, 
So um, you guys are a really great group. And like you mentioned earlier, a lot of us are kind of introverted. Do you have any like suggestions for a new member, especially if they're very anxious about talking to people? Do you have any tips about how they could act so they could kind of fit into a group easier? Well, one of the things I love about Urban Sketchers is that it's one of the few times where you can get together to eat and it's not rude to stop talking and just start <laughs> drawing while you eat. Where else can you do that? You know, I've tried doing that with family and it doesn't go over well. You know? <laughs> but with Urban Sketchers, it's just fine, you know. And so honestly, I think you come prepared to draw. And, you know, give it a try. And then when everybody gets together and shares the work, you can say, you know what, I'm new to this. People will be so excited that you showed up. You know, that's what I could pretty much promise is, you know, people go, oh, wow, that's great. You know, I think you'd just be willing to get in and do it. And you don't have to talk too much. That's okay. You just get in and do it. Yeah, true. That's that's true. Um some people who join warrior painters, they get really shy. And then I think I'm the type of person, even though I'm really introverted, I try to like pick at them because like, hey, talk to me, talk to me a little bit. I don't know if they like that though. So That's good. <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. I know there are a lot of people who kind of were afraid to pursue art when they're like younger. Some people make a sudden career change. Do you feel like age is a factor when it comes to learning art or wanting to become an artist? Oh, you know, that's a great question. I, I teach workshops at Descanso Gardens and I do like a series usually twice a year. And I've had students even in their 80s. A common story is, you know, when I was in high school or even college, this is what I wanted to do. And, you know, my life happened. I went into a career. I had children. I had, and it's often women, not always. I have men too, but a lot of the people at Descanso tend to be women of a certain age who have done something else for many years. And they've kind of nursed this secret love and passion that they've always wanted to do it, but they're a little afraid, but there's, they start to connect with each other. So they get to find out, Oh, I'm not the only one. No, you are never too old. You are never too old. And I honestly, I'm a person that's been fortunate to be doing this my whole life, but I never do it the same way twice. I have to always feel like I'm learning. I have to feel like I'm trying something new. I, it's just how you keep fresh and alive and interested, I think. Mm -hmm. Oh, somebody asked you, how could we get on the mailing list for your workshops? Oh, well, um, the best thing I would say would be send me a direct message on either Messenger on Facebook or DM me on Instagram. You should set up a mailing list because I'm sure a lot of people have interest to take your... Well, you know what? I I used to have a blog. It still exists, but I just haven't done anything with it for a long time. But I that's one of my projects right now is I absolutely will be setting up a website and then that will be a way to stay in touch with people. So that's cool. on my serious, serious to-do list now. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. yeah I, I'm going to definitely sign up for that. <laughs> um, what are some common issues that green artists often encounter at the beginning of their art learning journey? And what are your suggestions to help them overcome it? What was the first word? Green? Yeah. Like, uh, like new artists. Oh, you know, I think whether you are very young or whether you're much older, it doesn't matter. Um, you just try everything. I mean, just be open. And if you're really just getting started, you may not have a clue what it is you most want to do. And I think just try stuff and pay close attention mm -hmm. to what is it that you're drawn to. Do you see somebody doing something that your heart just jumps out? <laughs> that's a good sign that that might be something you really want to try. That might mm -hmm. be something you really want to do. You know, when you go somewhere, is there always something that attracts you? Is it the people or is it color? Just, is it the colors and textures of a place or what is it? And even if you feel like you don't know how to do it, you know, just practice that practice, that focus of what is it that really interests me? You know, sometimes I do a workshop and I have people start with, with drawings and then I'll look at the first set of drawings and say, okay, where did you get bored? And it's interesting how often people go, oh yeah, I really got bored when I was doing this thing right here because I kept felt like I had to keep doing it even though I didn't want to do it. I said, okay, that's a clue. So you <laughs> have to, it's like learning 
that sometimes we just have to do the work, but finding what it is that really interests you is, and that doesn't happen overnight. You know, it mm -hmm. may be a lot of trial and error to get to that. That's does right. that answer? I hope that helps answer the question. I don't know if that, that does. So. I, I feel like it does. Um, I don't know who asked the question, but I think that was a really great answer. <laughs> Um, who are some of the artists you look up to and have you taken any workshops from other artists? When I think about my art heroes, mainly they're like early 20th century artists, you know, but when I got into urban sketchers, oh my gosh, all these artists I just so admired. But when you talk about somebody I look up to that I took a workshop from, the one that really jumps out is an artist known as KK. He lives in Malaysia. He's trained as an architect. And he does usually fairly large, like panoramic drawings using a stick that comes off of a very specific tree in his front yard in Malaysia and Chinese ink. And he's, he uses other materials too, but that's the main thing is traditional Chinese ink and a stick. His work to me, and I was very honored that one of his books, he asked me to write something for it. And I said, it's <laughs> visual music. It just flows. It just is so beautiful and it just flows. And you can see the architectural training and, you know, in his knowledge of structures and buildings, but it just is this beautiful flow. I was so excited when I was in Chicago, the instructors used to get to take a workshop and I couldn't wait to take a workshop from him. And I, I did actually photograph, I asked him if I could do this and I took photos all the way through to, of his process. But it was just wonderful to watch him just start and just move, you know, like he's making music with this stick. And he brought for the workshop a suitcase for all the participants of sticks that we sharpened ourselves from his yard and bottles of Chinese ink. And if he uses like a, like a little puff or something like to do his shading, he has a very specific way that he works. And we all got to use his materials. And it's not like I'm gonna suddenly draw like cake, <laughs> but I, I'm so inspired by the very natural way that he works. And I really was so excited I got to take his workshop. So inspiring. I think I've seen his work before. It does look very like, rhythmic and stuff like that. it's really cool yeah. wow stick from his front yard i i gotta get one of those. Oh, no. I, I forget now it's a certain kind of a tree and it's very soft it's kind of a soft stick that he sharpens you know oh, that's and so it's cool. just so lovely and organic you know <laughs> and the chinese zinc has a particular quality to it and you know he'll use a little bit of water in some areas to just kind of blend it a bit and Anyway, <laughs> so by his work, he's kind of like the one I most look up to, I think, you know. Oh, I hope he listens to this episode. <laughs> um, do you have any hobbies or interests outside of art? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I like watching classic movies on TCM now and then, uh, you know, British m murder mysteries. And I love jazz. I love listening to jazz. Um, you know, I... But, the, you know, I, I like to cook, but there, you know, I'm one of those, I'm pretty much, I love to draw and paint, probably happy to do that most of the time. So. <laughs> Twinsies. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. I guess this will be like our final question. How do you stay motivated? And are there any mottos you would want to share with the audience? Okay. Mottos. Well, you know, Michelangelo's, and I wish I could remember it in Italian, but it's, it's, I'm always learning and it's. I, it's, I am always learning. And that's like in the present tense. I am always learning. And if that was good enough for Michelangelo, that's good enough for me. <laughs> and it's true. It's true. And that is what keeps me going. If I ever thought I had it all figured out or that I would just keep doing something that might've worked at some point, I, I'd be dead. I mean, dead as a person, dead as an artist, and I have to keep trying stuff. And even if it is an epic fail, <laughs> I just have to keep trying new stuff. And, and in a way, it's refining my own vision, but it's with trying something from a different point of view or a different material. Always just trying to get the heart to the heart of feeling the place that I'm in, you know, getting a sense of the place that I'm in. 
So your curiosity is what keeps you the most motivated then? I think that's a good word. Yeah, curiosity. That's really cool. Okay, I think we're at um, wrapping up today. And I just wanted to thank you for sharing your whole experience and spending some time with us. Uh, I learned a lot from it. And like I said, I always really admire you. So thank you for taking out the time on the Saturday. To oh, hang out with us. thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> and for everybody that tuned in, I hope something was useful. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for listening. We love hearing from you. Feel free to write us a review on Apple Podcasts or other platforms. Leave us a comment on YouTube or just message us on Instagram. If you want to support us, please consider donating on Gumroad. You'll find a link in the description. Alright, see you again soon!